Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. Episode. Maybe you want this to look like a, a Swiss chalet ski lodge or something like that. I, I don't know. But like all of these are fairly simple things to do. And it's just about being able to communicate the levels of customizations that people can have and understanding that even though we might say it's custom, certain custom things are actually really, really easy. Now, if you want to turn this into like a trapezoid or whatever, a geodesic dome, okay, that's a level of customization that gets into structural engineering. And that that That's a time and money thing. But that's to this day, that's kind of still, it's like that storytelling. How do we, how do we tie what we can do with what you as the, as the aspiring hotel owner want to achieve? What's up, Slick Talkers? I want to do Dynamic Duo sponsorship placements for our partners and the best Dynamic Duos I could put together for you are our first one of Hostfully and Minute. Now, you've probably heard our Minute with Minute segment with Nathan Smith over at Minute. If I could say Minute a thousand times, then I will. But basically, if you are using Hostfully's property management platform, then you can go to their integration marketplace and turn on your integration with Minute. So that way, everything is operating seamlessly in your hub to run your business without any issues and headaches. It just is so nice to have proper integration partners together. And I couldn't be more thankful for these two partnering with us on the podcast. So make sure you check out the show notes because we have special offers just for you from both companies, Hostfully and Minute, because you're a listener of the podcast and they love taking care of our listeners. So Check out the links in the show notes. And of course, like always, thank you for tuning into the podcast. All right. Chris Osaka, the founder, CEO of Tomu. Welcome to Slick Talk. How are you doing, my friend? Good. Good. Thanks for having me. Of course. You and I, you know, briefly got to to meet and introduce and hearing your story, it was uh pretty pretty interesting. You know, I I think as a former hotelier, you you get to experience a lot in our industry from the operations side and you had some great experience with with Hilton and I even saw some other experience working with Nike and other brand names that are are well known obviously. So I'm curious what what took you from hotelier and brand, you know, representation with Nike and other companies like that to now entrepreneur building out, you know, accessibility for people to become hotel owners themselves. Yeah, I actually, I actually kind of started in entrepreneurship or or small business, however you way you want to look at it. Uh, way back in the day, I owned a men's clothing store, so I kind of went from one industry all the way to all the way to the other. So it, I think it's always been you know something where I, I like to have I don't know if I like to have control over things or I just you know, I like to be more participatory and kind of see see it, see openings and things and want to see how I can participate in it. So that's where I got my start. And that's kind of where I started a lot of my career kind of in the the fashion and, and retail world. What what would you say is the big differentiator between retail and what you guys are doing with Tomu? And for all the listeners, maybe give some context on Tomu and the business model and what you guys are building and kind of how that all works. And for anyone listening, I highly recommend you go to the video version so you can see Chris's background to understand like the model of the interior of what Tomu a uh, Tomu unit looks like. So, but yeah, I would love for yeah. you to explain it real quick. Yeah. I, I, the core of Tomu is around, I, we, we started to see with the pandemic and the, the changes were already happening with how people were traveling, where they wanted to visit, what types of properties they were wanting to visit. And we saw a lot of people, tr- a lot more people trying to get into hotel ownership more mm-hmm. diverse types of people, people that have not just diverse in background, but diverse in trying to create different types of concepts that maybe haven't been out in the market so far. So for Tomo, it's about our building system and how we how our building system helps enable these these people trying to get into ownership, build the hotels that, that reflect their vision and, and trying to do that more cost effectively, quickly and and sustainably. 
But I think that's kind of one of the the underlying threads. It's all around kind of like experience. And that's what I did at, back at Nike it was a lot of retail development. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to create just the most uh, amazing consumer experience for somebody to shop and, and, and connect with connect with a brand on that. I think hospitality is, is, I mean, it's very much right in line with that. Like, that's why you are traveling is because you, you want it. You want the experience. I think the biggest difference that I found coming into hospitality from the retail world, which honestly was hard for me, it, it, it took a little kind of mind shift, mind shift set was uh, just the cadence of things, the speed of things. And in fashion and retail, you very much have this cadence of there's spring, there's summer, there's fall. And you, know, you can't bring your summer, your summer gear out in the middle of winter because nobody's going to buy it. It's too cold. It's not going to work. And so there's always something that's keeping you moving and progressing and innovating. And not to say that there aren't those drivers in, in the hospitality world, but you know, it's kind of like you, you get there when you get there. Um, and I think that's why typically in the hospitality space, we see whether it be technology or just new concepts, just take a little while to kind of like hit that critical mass because everybody just kind of waits to see if it's like, is this, is this idea going to work? Are people going to catch mm. on to it? Like, do people want this? I mean, it just, it just takes, takes more time. Right. Like, and then even within like short-term rentals, like you had Marriott jump into it with their homes and villas, but then you have other companies yeah. don't because they're still kind of like, what, what, what does this mean to us? So I, I think that's something that took a lot of time to get used to, but something that I hope that we bring to it is getting back to this idea of, you know, the consumer changes, people change, trends change, and we want to create a system that allows uh, the aspiring owners to kind of get ahead of it and keep up with it. I, I'm very curious on your response to this question, and it's more of a, a, a conversation starter than anything outside of being a question, but I'm reading a book called Originals by Adam Grant, and you know, the book is all about, you know, you talk, you look at Martin Luther King and all these other people that have made some big changes, whether it's political or, or entrepreneurial or whatever that they've done, they were considered quote unquote originals because they were the first ones to make the move that has an impact into society where a lot of people, you know, are more of like kind of what you just said, okay, we'll wait and see how Marriott homes and villas works before we jump in. And, you know, they're not the originals. They're usually the follower post the one or two companies or people that make the original move, would you consider yourself as an entrepreneur and an original, or do you like to play it safe sometimes in a kind of hedge risk? I think that's you kind of go to the definition of, of entrepreneurs. Like, yes, they are. And this obviously depends on who you ask, but yes, they are less risk adverse than the average person. But I think good entrepreneurs are the ones that always know how to manage risk they 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 try and hedge as much of it as possible so um you know while while we're certainly taking on something new that has a risk to it i think we we feel comfortable about it because we did the work beforehand we really spent a lot of time during the pandemic and then even after because we didn't know how much of this is just driven by the pandemic versus just change that's actually cultural and will be sustained that we wanted to put in the work of understanding what are people actually doing? If we can understand that mm-hmm. and we feel confident about it and we both from a qualitative and quantitative standpoint get that information, then we, then we feel good. We feel good taking that big leap because in our heads, we've actually mitigated a lot of the, the risk as, po- as possible. So, you know, I, I don't think recklessness is something that's a, a great trait. But, yeah, you have to have a certain appetite for at least being able to, to see maybe what others haven't quite wrapped their head around yet. Definitely. And, you know, we saw, especially on the short term rental side, I think with hotels, people were so during pandemic were so, you know, hey, I don't want to be in a public space where I'm sharing an elevator or a lobby or having to wait in line with other people from all over you know, the world to, to get my key card. And short term rentals really became, you know, the, the go to market basically for travel and experience. And and, you know, that drive to destination model was really, really great. Mm-hmm. A lot of people had some of the best, you know, years or, or profitability of their, their business during this time. And, you know, you're saying you, you guys have been putting in the work and you're making sure that like, is this sustainable? Is this going to live past COVID? I, what, what was your guys like findings from that is because your guys' model is so unique. And I think people do want unique stays. I do think people are tired of cookie cutter buildings where it's the same 
hotel lobby bar, maybe a restaurant. Then you got the same type of rooms. Maybe they're designed a little bit better, but yeah, it's still the same floor plan. Really. It's a studio apartment without a kitchen and you pretty much are, are getting the same type of experience, whether it's in one city or the other. And your guys' model is completely different where you have such a unique design and layout and floor plan. And, and these units are able to be anywhere. Like you could, you know, get five acres down the road and, you could have a great sustainable little hospitality business. So what was the, the overall findings, you know, with this, this new travel trend is this living past COVID. Yeah. I, I think, especially with all the people that you talk to, you have a really unique kind of outlook on this. Cause I think the world before COVID was almost this, this binary of you either stay in hotels or you're a short-term rental person. Mm-hmm. And the pandemic really created that pendulum swing of like, well, now I'm not going to the hotels. I'm going to do the, the short-term rental, just like you just said. And now I think we're seeing that pendulum's kind of like swinging back a little bit where it's no longer a binary. It's more of a spectrum of all of these different hospitality concepts sits somewhere on the spectrum between, hey, here's this full-size giant mega resort to an individual Airbnb. But within it, there's these concepts that are popping up that are a little smaller, a little bit more kind of curated around maybe a specific type of of experience. And there's no real definition, I think, anymore on what makes you a hotel versus a rental, like kind of like there's, you can be almost any size and give it any sort of programming or experience level for the guest. And you, know, you fit somewhere uh, with within that. So I think we we started to see a lot of that of, of the, the settling of where consumers are going to be. And then that that pendulum swing of the short-term rentals are great. And you had a lot of those amenities, the extra space, the kitchen, but then you also started to see people where there was like, you know what, there's still some things in a house that is a little bit too much like a house. And sometimes I want to get, get away from that. It's nice to cook a meal together with friends, but also if I'm in an open concept area and I just had a giant meal with my friends and others, it's mess. Now I get to look at that for the rest of the day until I do the dishes and I don't want to do dishes because I'm on vacation or I want to do kind of minimal things. So it's for us, I was trying to understand some of these like habits of people and where those are landing and how much they actually want to take on when they're on a, on a trip that can still give them that essence of getting away that a hotel does, but give them kind of all the amenities and the the features that they got used to when they were doing kind of a short term rental during the pandemic. I love that. And you know, you, you mentioned going from retail to hospitality was hard for you. Why was that so hard? Like, I know there's that seasonality piece where you can't put it close, you know, summer clothes out during the middle of winter, but like, what was the real big challenge getting into hotels, hospitality from retail? Some of it's cultural. I think for, for me is that with, with retail or fashion, not that there aren't barriers to entry, but You know, if you have an idea, you have a vision of what you wanted to create as either your own clothing line or your own store, you could do it. You could figure out a way. And you you hear a lot of people just like, oh, I'm going to start my own T-shirt line. And that's kind of how they get into it. Or I'm going to buy vintage goods and I'm going to either resell them or customize them. There's always these ways for for new people to get in and to bring a new idea. And that brings a diversity of of thought that brings a diversity of products. And that is what makes the the industry fun and interesting. And there's always something kind of new to be looked at and kind of what keeps everything moving along. And I think that change in the hospitality was difficult because, because the barrier to entry is so high economically and the group of people that are involved in it is so small. It can be a little bit of the, the good old boys club where suddenly there's like, it's just that much harder to get a new concept in. And, and when, you know, if you're if you're in a room with people all saying the same thing and you're the one person saying, hey, I actually have a different idea that, you know, suddenly either you get drowned out, maybe not intentionally, but it's just it just makes it that much harder to get your voice, get your voice heard and to get a new idea out there. And ultimately, I think that just kind of impacts people like you and I that just like like cool spaces. We like to experience new things. And if everything is done around, let's just keep it the way it is or let's mitigate as much risk as we can that comes off in the places that we stay. And we've all stayed at those places where you're just like, Oh God, like God, this is (laughs) ugly. God, this is boring. God, I've seen this before. Like it's unmemorable. And that kind of makes a terrible experience, like terrible travel experience, at least to me. I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe you like that. I don't know. 
Uh, see, there's a time and a place for it, right? Like sometimes when I'm like on a tight agenda schedule, I just want simple and like I don't need wow, I don't need design, I don't need. I just want a good bed, good shower, and potentially a restaurant or a bar where I can go grab dinner at night. You know, and so kind of going into that, I was that young hotel manager that came into a room full of the either the owners or the GM or the regional director who they've been doing this for 20 years. This is how we've always done it. This is the way the business works, blah, 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 blah. This is how our hotel runs. And then you have that idea and the meeting, you, you go off of a limb and you become an original, right? You have something that's new and different, maybe a little creative. You say it and then you get blank stares and you get like, no, that's just not how it works. And you know, the, the labor cost that goes into this and then immediately you hear five reasons why your idea isn't going to work, which could be valid, could not be valid. I'm curious for you in the hotel world, you know, going back to that original question, you know, with, with Chris, let's not, I even put Tomu into it, but let's put Chris as an entrepreneur and, you know, how many times or experiences did you have in your hotel career where you tried to do that? You raised your hand, you had an idea and that just kind of, I think maybe built up into what is Tomu today? Oh man, a lot. <laughs> like throwing people or things under the bus. Yeah, it was my first couple months in the hospitality world. Like the company with the company was great. Like it was a huge, great learning yeah. experience. Um, great, really kind people. That's something that also took me aback coming from fashion retail into hospitality. It's just how, how nice everybody, everybody is. And the problem with that is like, they're also so nice to you that like, if you disagree with them, like, how do I disagree with you in a way where it's like, I just, I need you to see my perspective. I need to push yourself a little harder. I disagree with you, even though I think you're really, uh, really nice. But yeah, I think it was, I am, I'm like the little kid. I'm like the, I'm the, but why kid? But why? But why? And like, mm -hmm. I keep asking that question and, and that can certainly irritate a lot of people, especially when they're not prepared to, to answer that. But that's kind of how I, I went about it is like, there, I got a lot of like that. This is the way it's done, or there are reasons for this, and there always are. There always is a reason. It's just is that reason still valid? Has the world changed? Are we planning around something that is no longer kind of a you know a, a factor that we have to worry about? And some people, I think, sometimes people that have been doing it for such a long time forget that hey, I actually don't need to to worry about this thing anymore, or or plan around this thing. It's a non-issue, and so therefore maybe certain things that are way downstream, they can now change even though they never thought to. So I, I went into it uh, with the person that hired me uh, kind of very openly. I was saying, hey, like the worst thing you can do is fire me. And I, and I didn't mean it yeah. agonistically, but I'm like, I'm going to like ask questions. Like I'm, I'm going to put my nose in the places that it probably shouldn't be because I need to understand like the full picture before I can solve solve something. Otherwise, I'm just like, you may tell me to go do something and I might do it, but I might actually not actually solve the thing that you really want me to do just because you told me to, mm -hmm. to do it. So there was there was that understanding. And that was, a, I think that was kind of a, a big part of it is like just kind of getting that that level set of you, you can fire me if I am not the right fit. And I can go back to my world of, of playing with clothes and shoes. And it, it'll always be there for me. I kind of accidentally ended up in hospitality and I love it. But it's not to say that if it's the, this thing doesn't work out, my world will end. So I think for me, that was a big start of it. And then just going to ask a lot of people. And it, I was, whether or not I was in marketing and I needed to talk to people in revenue management or development or in loyalty, it's like understanding what is everybody's little driver? Like, what are they trying to achieve? So at least I can have that in my mind as I kind of create new new, new ideas um, without without stepping on toes, but still trying to like, change things a little bit yeah why do you think a lot of us accidentally stumble into hospitality that's been a common theme either with guests i talked to on the show it's like i stumbled into entre entrepreneurship in our industry or i stumbled into operating short-term rentals or a hotel it's the number one probably beginning statement for a lot of people on the show why do you think that is I, I think that's kind of the, the beauty of, of it is that a lot of times I think we as people forget we know what we know. We forget what we know could be unique. And we might be very versed in something 
in a different industry and doing something that everybody in that industry takes for granted. But the moment we get thrown into a different situation and we're faced with people that are kind of like, oh, I've never thought that way or I've never considered it that way, that that's kind of fun. You like you get to be the person to bring that idea idea in. So like it and it's I mean, it's kind of a sexy industry, right? Like, I mean, there are parts of it that are that are a little like sausage makey. And, you know, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, you get into certain like events or whatever, they can be a little dull, but like travel and hotels is, is sexy. Like, I mean, they're beautiful spaces and beautiful places. Like who wouldn't want to be, be a part of that and try and find ways for more people to experience that. I, I do think that there's a lot, a lot of power, power there. And it's like, it's not just service level. Like I do think with travel, like it does create a lot of connectivity and understanding and, you know, there are always going to be people in hospitality where they're a real estate person, they're a money person, they're looking at cash yeah. flows, they're looking at pro formas, like, you know, they're just, give, make, let me make, let me make my property make money. And that is, that is a part of it. But I think it gets really interesting and inspiring where it's like, rather than that being the goal, that just is the foundation. And then you're trying to take kind of things to the next level by creating new experiences for people. Yeah. Did you travel a lot growing up? No, actually, no, I, he's in the, in the other room, so I can't badmouth him too much, but no, I, I my, <laughs> my dad, um, I, I think my family in general, and I, I think a lot of people in that, in that age group are, are, are similar where they kind of like going to where they know. And it's like, whether yeah. it's the same place every summer or every fall, where are you going on your, on your family vacation? That was, I think that was kind of, that was me. So I, I got to go to some, some nice places, but it was never very varied. And um, when I started working for Nike, I got to travel a little bit more, but it was still very retail focused. So I, I got to see a lot of the, the beautiful malls across the United States. But you know, you're not, <laughs> you're not necessarily always going to the most culturally rich sorts of experiences. But at least that kind of got me out of the, you know, part of it's just like the, the feeling safe, I got to feel safe when I'm hopping on a new plane, going to a new airport, trying to figure my way around. Once you have a little bit of that confidence of like, okay, I know you can drop me into any one city and I can kind of figure out where to go. You know, that suddenly you, you let your guard down enough to want to be a little bit more exploratory, but no, it actually, it, it took a, it took somebody that I was dating to call me out and say like, Hey, you are not very, you are not very adventurous enough when it comes to your, your travels. Like you kind of like boring, safe, resorty things and i was like yeah i mean i kind of work hard and when i when i have some time off i want to like chill but when that relationship didn't work out which just happened to coincide with the opportunity at hilton it was like you know what this is it i'm gonna if for nothing else they have a great employee discount program and i'm gonna use that discount to just do laps around the world as many times as i can just to prove this this person wrong and to be being a more adventurous person. So, but it, I, I think to, to your question, it, it takes effort. You really got to put yourself out into that, into that position. Otherwise uh, it becomes very safe to, to stay and go to the same places over and over again. See, you and I are way more similar than probably I, I expected. Even, even from our pre-chat in the same sense, growing up, I same yeah, summer camp, har harp on you too. <laughs> That too, uh, ex-girlfriends being like, you don't travel enough. And when you do, you only want to go to like Cancun and go to like this resort or go to Cabo. I'm like, yeah, because it's like, like you said, I work hard. And when I want to take time off, I kind of want to know what to expect. And when I'm in a situation that I'm not either the most comfortable in or, or maybe aware of, that does definitely put up like a guard. And you know, it, it is what it is. And my friends also hate me because like they want to go skiing or snowboarding. And I'm like, I'll go with you, but I'm going to sit in the hot tub. I want to cook dinner. Like by the time you guys are done, like it'll be great. And you know, we'll we'll be good. And they're like, you don't even want to try skiing. I'm like, no, I'm good. I like, I know what I want and I don't want to do skiing. So I mean, but I'm curious, you know, going your, your day to day, right? Like if you are, yeah, whether you're working in operations or on a property or you're just in a role where you're constantly having to think and do and problem solve, it's like you want your vacation wants to be the opposite of that. Like, I just want to like <laughs> turn this off for a second and and relax whereas maybe some of my friends or you know people around us when we go on vacation with them they're kind of doing the opposite they're doing something that's very like you know i'm just kind of like doing my thing day to day i don't have to kind of mentally stress too hard that when i take a trip or a vacation i do want to exercise those those mental muscles and yeah. kind of put myself out there which you know completely understandable but you know you and i it's like kind of sometimes we want to turn it off
All right. So you're trying to grow your portfolio and your property management business, but sometimes owners don't have the best peace of mind when it comes to giving up the keys to their home to an unknown brand or company. And of course, let's be honest. Sometimes we hear the horror stories of guests and the bad guests that stay in vacation rentals and throw parties. Well, safely as you covered, because not only do they screen your guests that are staying, but they also ensure that you are covered from all things such as ill intent, stupidity, aka vacation brain, and other things like pet damage and theft. While doing that, you are able to partner with Vintory and grow your portfolio with their marketing platform that helps ensure that you are attracting the right owners to your rental program and growing your business in the destination that you are in. Or if you're in multiple destinations, that works too. So get the links in the show notes because both companies have special offers. And if you don't use a link, but you end up talking to them, guess what? Just tell them that Will Slicker sent you from Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, and they'll get you covered. And you can also let them know that maybe you've heard of them on our platform, hospitality.fm. So of course, like always, make sure you grab the links in the show notes. And thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now. Back to the episode. Yeah, and, and great like segue because you know with with Tomu, I, I'm curious on you know, talking about the the experience earlier when you're talking about people in the lobby and like the design and the way that people want to experience a getaway. For me, like you just said, I don't know if I'm really the guy that wants to have that stimulation of adventure and travel when I'm on vacation or when I'm traveling because of like the day to day job. But I love watching people experience that. That's why when I was a hotel manager, I loved being in the lobby when we had a fun event or when we had like our happy hour or when it was just a really good day. Everyone's in a good mood. No one had horrible travel issues and like just getting to experience people connect and, and, and enjoy what we've you know offered or created in the lobby. And, you know, I, I love to watch it. And so for you, give me a vision of Tomu because you guys are different than you're not building hotels so to speak, but you're giving the ability to let people build a hotel like experience that's unique, that's different without the front desk, without the hotel, you know, lobby gift shop and the bar, like you have such a different approach. So I guess walk me through this vision uh, of, of being able to experience that. Yeah. And this, I think goes back to what I was saying earlier about it's hospitality is less of a binary now. So, so as it is more of like a spectrum of, of types of experiences and all of those experiences, the other side of it is the person that is responsible for it, the, the owner, the operator. And I think that starts with, it could be a single person. I mean, the, the Airbnb arbitrage, I know that's kind of gotten thrown a lot, thrown around a lot lately where it's like, Hey, I'm going to go rent this place and then I'm going to turn it into a short term rental. I'm going to dress it up. And that might be their way in because it's financially the, the lowest barrier to entry. But what we've seen with a lot of the people that we interact with, it tends to be a little bit of a stepping stone. They, they like the industry, they want to grow in the industry. And so they might go from a short term rental to maybe a couple short term rentals, or they go to maybe a bed and breakfast, something a single property with multiple keys. And then they they kind of go up from there. Conversely, I think we see people come from really large properties, maybe they were an, uh, a manager or an operator there. And now it's kind of like I want to I like I learned a lot of the really good skills there, but now I kind of want to apply it to maybe a more curated or or personal experience. So I think we, the company Tome, we kind of see ourselves as a reflection of that, and we want to enable the different people along that spectrum. So that could be somebody that they just want to get their first short term rental, and so they can they can use one of our our kind of prefab uh, structures to be that first one, and and it's designed around being used for hospitality. So it's like the way we explain that is, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to cook Thanksgiving dinner in a, in a short term rental. Maybe you are, but most of the time when you're on vacation, you're not going to be cooking Thanksgiving dinner. So you don't need that giant kitchen. So we'd rather use that space for the lounging areas that you see behind me or a bigger bathroom with a soaking tub or, or a rain shower. And that kind of creates a really nice experience. But going back to the, the spectrum, that one person can have one property and it can be a really premium experience. All the way up to, we see ourselves more as a more of a participant, so and an enabler. So if somebody does want to do the big property that has centralized check-in and F and B areas or a spa, and they already have that, 
and they just want to add to it or create new guest rooms, like we can take on that aspect of it while they focus on the other core elements. So it never has to be just a single unit. We can be part of these larger, uh, larger concepts, whether they be a hundred key property or a 50 key property. We just become again, participatory in that, in that kind of development process to whatever degree that they need us on. And sometimes it's, it's really about making their, their timeline a little bit faster, where if they can have their, their GC focus on these central areas, great. And we can prefab all the guest rooms beforehand that, that speeds us along, but we really do see, and this is what makes, I think being in our position really fun is we see all the different ways that people want to use or apply our, 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 our product or our, our rooms where it could be a, one guy has a vineyard and they do weddings, but they can't host the wedding parties there and they want to be able to do that. So they want to add units. They want to add two dozen units there. Another guy, he's uh, he's got a beer brand. And so they just bought a new building as a as their new dis, uh, not distillery, brewery. And uh, they want to make it kind of an experience where people can stay for the weekend and experience their beer brand. Like that's something else all the way to a gentleman who feels like black travelers are are under catered to and the rooms aren't designed around the types of amenities they want to a restaurant tour that's mixed race and he wants to create an all-inclusive concept that reflects his 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 heritage in his new restaurant concept so we we see all these cool like really personal ideas and we want to be want them to be able to use our system whether it's something that We've already designed kind of our pre-designed product for something where they take our building system and reskin it to match their aesthetic or their needs. That that becomes really kind of cool and how we kind of see ourselves within the broader kind of hospitality ecosystem. Uh, I love that. And Sorry, you know, that, was, that was a lot. Going back, no, no, that was great because actually you pretty much answered my next question on like, what do you guys get to see when it comes to like the creativity of people you know, ordering these units from you guys. And that, you know, my next question kind of leading after that was, you know, launching in or starting in 2020 to now we're in 2023, we're in Q, Q4 and a Q3. I can't remember what day it is, but yeah, going into Q4 yep. and, you know, yeah, I'm very curious for, you know, your first orders are, are just going to be going out now. What's been the biggest maybe not even hurdles. Cause I, I know it's obviously there's tons of challenges with supply chain issues or other logistical things that you guys have had, had to go through, but maybe outside of this creativity and getting to see the application between all these different creators and entrepreneurs, you know, what, what's been the, I guess the biggest lessons along the way in the last three years where now you're actually going to see the, the units on the ground. Yeah. I, I think there are, there are technical obstacles that we, that we face, there are more just perceptual obstacles we face. I mean, the, the easy ones, the technical obstacles were like, we thought people were going to be buying these for vacation homes originally when we first launched. I, I don't think we quite really appreciated the demand that was out there. So we thought people were going to be buying one, two, three of these to create little getaways. And so we designed a system that was kind of built around that scale. Suddenly, when somebody says, I need 50 or I need 100, you know, we, we physically need to make sure that the dimensions of these are optimized so that they use fewer trucks to transport uh, and that they are compliant with more right road regulations state by state. Uh, but those things were very, I would say, relatively easy to solve because we know what we're solving for. I think the perceptual hurdles were a little bit more challenging because I don't I don't necessarily think we created a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. I think we created a solution to a problem that definitely exists, but people don't realize what their options are in solving that, solving it. And by that, I mean, in the development world, okay, construction costs are rising, uh, supply chain is an, you know, it, it definitely was an issue. It still is an issue. Labor, all of these things are making properties just more expensive to, to develop. And with that, that barrier to entry just gets even higher for people. Conversely, I, I don't think a lot of people within the hospitality space really are aware of the options that they have when it comes to building. Uh, and so modular, I would say, was part of that. Even in the residential side, uh, people people are becoming more and more open to modular building because they, they kind of wrap their minds around what it is. I think what it means to a hospitality developer is still kind of nebulous. And if they do think of modular, they think of, well, maybe it's a bit more of like a tower, like a, like a Citizen M type uh, structure, as opposed to 
just the flexibility to create everything that you already want to create and just be able to do it offsite and control a little bit more of it. I think that the perception is, well, if I do prefab, I'm, I'm accepting a lot of compromises. And there are little little bits and pieces where there are because you know just by its very nature, you're, you're trying to ship something or you're trying to work within an existing system that, yeah, if you want to hire an architect and designer and do something completely custom, yeah, yeah, you, you'll, you'll have the world, but you're also going to uh, pay for it. So I think for us, that, that hurdle of just trying to get people to understand what can they do with our system. I think also people see our pre-designed stuff and they think, well, that's, you're kind of a one trick pony. That's, that's all you have to offer me. And I want to do something completely different. And for us, it's like, no, you can, you really can, you can, you can change the skin of this, the exterior to match whatever you already have the interior. Maybe you want this to look like a, a Swiss chalet ski lodge or something like that. I, I don't know, but like all of these are fairly simple things to do. And it's just about being able to communicate the levels of customizations that people can have and understanding that even though we might say it's custom, certain custom things are actually really, really easy. Now, if you want to turn this into like a trapezoid or whatever, a geodesic dome, okay, that's a level of customization that gets into structural engineering. And that, that, that's a time and money thing, but, um, uh, that's to this day, that's kind of still, it's like that storytelling. How do we, how do we tie what we can do with what you as the, as the aspiring hotel owner want to achieve? Would you consider this hotel ownership? Like, would you consider this like classified hotel or would you just classify? Cause earlier on when you were talking about this kind of, you know, on the, earlier days, it was either you stay at a hotel or you stay at a short-term rentals. And now there's this pendulum of like, I stay at either, right? Like I can stay, I'm not like picking one or the other usually anymore. It's becoming very blended. Would you just say now people who are wanting to go into this type of experience, whether it's through Tomu or through short-term rentals and multifamily and single family to hotel ownership, would you say now we're all becoming hospitality entrepreneurs rather than hotel? Like, would you consider this hotel basically? I I would, but to your point, I think part of this is the, the the nomenclature of, that we use is still kind of like evolving. Like we have to find terms that don't necessarily create delineations between you're either yeah. a, a, a short-term rental host or you are a hotel owner slash hotelier. And we definitely even on our own website have you know we, well, what's what's the right what's the right noun to use in these in these circumstances. But I, I think we absolutely feel like these are applicable to hospitality broadly and. I think you see in Europe and Asia, you see a lot more types of hospitality concepts coming online and, uh, and there's, they're so varied. Like they're not, they're not prescriptive by any means. There's not like, okay, you have to have this many keys. You have to have these sorts of uh, amenities on site. You have to have the business center. Like it, you know, it, mm-hmm. I think a hotel can be, it can be 20 or 30 keys. You can have a little cafe or, or a small restaurant, maybe even like a, like a, even just like a teeny little steam room sauna spa thing. Like it doesn't need to be this like monolithic, you know, massive development. You can take all of those elements and just create it in a little bit more intimate experience. So that it doesn't make it any less of a hotel or hospitality experience than the 250 room like resort. Like I, I just don't, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think that's it. It doesn't, it's not what it needs to be. And within that kind of shrinking and creating more, more depth and variety, you're going to get more people that can say, you know, I like, I like this 20 key or 30 key with a spa concept. I just want to do it in this thematic. And maybe it's Mediterranean themed as opposed to Asian theme. Like, who knows? Like, there is so much white space out there for people to really personalize these things. I think that's where the beauty of it, of it is. And and you're just going to get more and more people that that are going to be able to see their own visions and bring them to life. And and it still makes them a part of the industry and a quote unquote hotelier or a hotel owner, however we want to evolve to refer to them. Yeah, no worries. I, I, I love that answer, too. And, you know, my kind of last question for you, you know, on our pre-chat, we talked about certain things within Tomu that aren't just, you know, fabrication and building, you know, a unit or a property for, for people to operate. But I also heard on another podcast, I, I think it was uh, either all in or this week in startups or something that was evolving. I think Glenn Fogel from booking.com and 
you know, one of the topics he brought up the hotel lobby and not the lobby in general, but the gift shop, right? Like a lot of these people are moving away from traditional hotels, whether it's, you know, a Marriott or a Hilton to a, you know, an independent, you know, a lot of, you know, I guess the conversation around it was more of like, we all love money. We all love making money. That's kind of the whole point. And obviously to provide a good hospitality experience, and a lot of people through the the growth and spike of Airbnb and short term rentals, but then also through COVID and just these other things, realize like revenue shouldn't just come from the nightly rate, right? Like you should be able to find other streams of revenue. And I think you and I talked about this, and I've had other you know founders on the show that are either creating similar things, not to Tomu, but the ability of creating a digital or experiential lobby within their property. So if you say at my vacation home, you love the mattress, you should be able to scan it, order it, have it sent to your house and maybe the robes are available. And it's like a digital kind of gift shop experience when it comes to ancillary revenue. I hate that word because it's so hard to pronounce sometimes, but when it comes to ancillary revenue, you know, with Tomu operators, are you seeing people try to apply these new concepts of like the digital gift shop to their, to their units? Or are you guys doing anything in particular to enable that? Like give me an inside peek into the exterior of nightly rate revenue. Yeah, going back to some of the the creative examples that we see from the people that come in and want to use our, our system, I, I think that's like a perfect example. They are using our system to build upon something that they want to do, which it almost becomes like the reverse of that, right? Like if you're a hotel owner, you think of like, here's the rooms, and then whether it's F&B or any of these other experiences, physical or digital, are kind of quote unquote ancillary rate. I think what makes our position interesting is it's the people that otherwise rely on the ancillary like revenue that that is actually their core business. That's their core like knowledge. And they're now trying to uh, their ancillary revenue becomes actually the nightly rate. So it's kind of interesting to see that that confluence uh, kind of come together. And so that can be as as literal as like our rooms are just an amenity to somebody's restaurant concept. But again, it's so broad where there are designers, they, they might have their own furniture line. And so now these rooms are just going to be a almost like a experiential showroom for the furniture that this company, this company has. And then ultimately, they're try, trying to drive them back to their website to purchase it. Or maybe it's a spa, a spa amenity, or, you know, whether it's uh, scents, candles, you know, things like that. And it's, they are just using the rooms to create the experience that best articulates or, or, or conveys their, their product and then tying it back to whatever system they have to, uh, to transact. So very much kind of almost like just flipping, flipping the script a, a little bit. That's very interesting. Uh, not what I was ex- actually expecting. So that's pretty cool. I, Chris, this I, has I, been <laughs> an answer. No, no, that was great. No, it's just like, it's cool to see like an, an expectation, right? Like a lot of uh, at least in my world, a lot of short-term rental people, they realize like, hey, we have all these amenities, whether it's local businesses that are plugged in or their own product or just something that they love personally and use at home and apply to their short-term rental, right? So they're like, all right, I want to be able to sell this. I want to be able to make this like make money, but also be something great to offer to my guests. And to hear it the opposite, I find it actually really cool because like I came from, um, you know, I got to work with a great founder in our, in, in the industry and he, you know, they have not only a hotel, they have a fine dining hotel that's you know adults only to then a fine dining restaurant to their own brewery. And they've, you know, they've built an ecosystem in this, in this destination. And so to like, think of like the application of that, right. To be able to offer their beer, their linens, their whatever into this experience fully encompassing is actually really cool. So yeah. Long story short, I just thought that answer was... And I, I think cool. there are great examples. Like, it's not even like very like startup uh, individuals that are doing it. I think there are really great examples of of successful brands that, you know, there's some successful you know, Japanese sushi restaurant. They started as a, as, a, as a very successful Japanese change and then they went into hotels and now their hotels in and of themselves are very desirable, trendy places. But that was them t- taking what they know their experience that they know their customers love and just applying it to, again, from their perspective, what, what would be ancillary revenue, but from a hotelier's perspective, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's yeah. first. So very cool. Super cool. Yeah. So Chris, I guess to wrap up the episode, you know, 
you guys are you're starting to ship out some units. It's going to be pretty quick. Your first round of orders are, are going out. And I guess for any of the listeners, my favorite kind of question is the easy you know, self plug for you is like, where can they find out more? And for all of our listeners on on Slick Talk, please check out the show notes. We have a special little offer for you from Tomu. So if you're interested in building out your own thing, because I know a lot of our people, especially again, short term rental heavy with some of my friends and colleagues, but a lot of us, you know, started with short term rentals and now I have plenty of friends and Mike Shogren is a great example, but he has now three hotels. So he's not only got like 70 homes, but he's got three hotels that he's applied the same type of thing. So to be able to go beyond the hotel now and create a destination kind of how I imagine a, a Tomu unit or units being, you know, I think that's pretty exciting. So I guess where can people connect and, and reach out with you? Yeah, they can definitely visit us at our website. It's tomuhouse.com, T-O-M-U-H-A-U-S.com. And they, they can learn more about us. I, I think at the end of the day, yes, we, we talk about hospitality a lot in hotels, but at the end of the day, this is a pretty malleable space. If people want to live in it themselves, it's just going to become a second residence. There's there's so many applications for these where, you know, ultimately it's we just want people to have a good experience, whether they're providing for themselves or for somebody else that, you know, we are we we try to be non-exclusionary. So if you are just looking for something individual for yourself or you're looking for a hundred plus of these to create some resort, it is something that we we love working with people and seeing what sort of ideas that they have. So we look forward to them reaching out to us. Of course. Well, Chris, I, I really enjoyed this episode. So thank you so much for taking the time and, oh, thank and you. connecting with me. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. And for all the, the slick talkers out there, make sure you like and subscribe to all things Tomu. Connect with Chris on LinkedIn. We'll make sure we have everything plugged in the show notes. I promise. Sometimes we've realized we may have missed a link or two. So sorry about that in the past episodes, but that won't happen again today. And of course, like always, we'll see you guys again next week. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, possible. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content, or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week. Thank you.